All right, welcome back, and I think we're on the seventh screencast of chapter six. And what we're gonna do in this screencast is we've already seen the majority rule win set for single dimensional models. We're gonna find the majority rule win set for two dimensional models. And it's very, very, very similar in terms of the way we find it, all right? So how do we find the majority rule win set? Well, find each voter's preferred two set for the status quo. Determine the minimum number of votes needed to defeat the status quo. So we take the number of voters, divide by two, round up to the nearest integer. All right. This threshold is often called K in social choice theory. All right. These are the, then we find all the places where K or more of the preferred two sets overlap. This is the same set of steps from the single dimensional model. I literally copied this slide into this uh, slide deck and change the theme. It's the same set of step, steps. Find the preferred two sets, find how many voters you need to have a majority, simple majority, find where that many preferred two sets overlap. It's the same exact set of steps. So here are our old friends, Ted, Marshall, and Barney. Let's find a majority rule win set. So I'm going to give an alternative here why. All right, so we need to find everyone's preferred two set. So first for Ted, there is Ted's preferred two set. It's a, it's a circle centered on his ideal point running through the alternative we are considering. The status quo here is why. Why is it a circle? Because Ted has single peaked and symmetric preferences. Therefore, his utility function is either a cone or it's kind of that parabolic symmetrically shaped dome thing that I showed in the first screencast for two-dimensional models. So his indifference curves are circles. We don't need to draw all of them. There's an infinity of them. We just need to draw the one we need to say what are all the things he likes the same as Y, what are the things he likes better than Y. The black indifference curve are the things he likes the same as Y. The blue shaded region are all the alternatives he strictly prefers to Y. That is Ted's preferred two set of Y. Same thing here for Barney. He is indifferent to Y and all of the alternatives on his indifference curve, the concentric circle around, centered around his ideal point. He strictly prefers everything in green. He's indifferent to everything on his indifference curve. And he strictly dislikes compared to Y everything outside of the circle. Marshall also here is his preferred two set and his indifference curve. Indifference curve runs through Y, preferred two set is in this kind of salmon color. All right, so here are our three voters. Where, what is the majority rule win set? So we have everybody's preferred two set. Now we have to figure out how many of them overlapping do we need to have a majority, the minimum. We need at least two, right? Take three, Divide by two, you get 1.5. Round up to the nearest integer, it's two. For a simple majority, we need at least two people to prefer things. So I wanna know what is the set of things that at least two people prefer. That is the majority rule win set. And we can see it here, I've kind of made these translucent. Ted and Marshall prefer all of these things. Marshall and Barney prefer all of these things and Ted and Barney prefer all of these things to Y. So all three of these regions are the win set of Y. All of the alternatives in those three petals would beat Y in pairwise majority rule. Again, this is the pairwise majority rule win set. All right, We're gonna look at the unanimity win set later on, but this is the pairwise majority rule win set. It's the same set of steps you used in the single dimensional model. Find the preferred two sets, find out how many of them you need to overlap, and then find all places where that number of them, at least that number of them, it could be more, at least that number of them overlap, all right? That is the win set, all right? The set of alternatives where at least two preferred two sets overlap. So if Barney got to be the proposer, it's the same sort of game we looked at when I was walking you through the median voter example, all right? Let's say Y is the status quo, and Barney proposes that star, all right? 
You might think, actually, Barney wouldn't propose that star, right? Barney's going to propose the closest thing in the wind set to his ideal point, but we'll get to those sorts of things later on. But let's just say Barney proposes this. Maybe he um, just guesses, all right? And he proposes something kind of almost smack dab in the middle of the issue space. Would it pass? Of course it would pass. It's in the wind set. That's literally what the wind set means. It's the set of things that win. So using pairwise majority rule, because that alternative is in the majority rule win set, it would pass. And it would now become the new status quo. All right. So I'm going to draw the indifference curves going through here. So where is the new win set? All right. Well, it's everywhere that at least two people's preferred two sets overlap. What is the majority rule win set? Any alternative where at least two preferred two sets overlap, it's these two petals. Anything in those two areas will beat the new status quo that is the star. So um, let's say Ted proposes, uh, Ted's a little smarter than Barney was. He's proposing something very close to his ideal point that is in the win set. He could have done a little bit better, but he's not just um, picking something in the middle. He's He's trying to get the closest, something closer to his ideal point. So if Ted proposed that, would it pass? Absolutely. It is in the win set. Everything outside of the win set would lose under pairwise majority rule. Everything in the majority rule win set would pass. All right. It'll win and it becomes the status quo. So we draw all the indifference curves again. Is there still a win set? All right, or are we converging on some sort of equilibrium like we did in the single dimensional model? All right, we are not actually. Unlike the single issue dimension model, this process almost never has an equilibrium when using pairwise majority rule. So in a single issue dimensional space with um, single peaked uh, utility, one issue dimension, pairwise majority rule gave us an equilibrium the ideal point of the median voter. Everything from the median voter theorem, hold it the same except add one dimension. Let them consider policies or votes that have more than one aspect to them. And, and this happens all the time, right? In Congress, when they vote on a bill, there's a multitude of issue dimensions that are at play when they vote on a bill. And even within, say, a faculty meeting, Right? Even if we're voting on a curriculum change, people may have different conceptions of what the actual issue dimension is. So it's very common to have multidimensional issues. And using pairwise majority rule, even if we have single peaked and symmetric utility, we do not get an equilibrium. I could keep going all day long with one of them proposing, and they would always be able to find a thing, an alternative in the wind set that is closer to their ideal point. And we would just go round and round and round and round. And this finding has a name. It's called the McKelvey Schofield Chaos Theorem. In almost all multidimensional spatial settings, and when you go to three dimensions, four dimensions, five dimensions, it just gets crazier, right? All you need is two dimensions to get this result. Higher dimensions, it gets even stronger, all right? In almost all multidimensional spatial settings, there will be no majority rule in empty win set point. Said another way, there will be no condor say winner under pairwise majority rule. Any alternative in the space can be reached by whoever controls the order of voting. So in other words, if Ted was the agenda setter here, he could structure a series of votes that would eventually end up at his ideal point. He could reach his ideal point if he was allowed enough rounds of proposing alternatives to face the status quo. They would keep going and going and we would redraw all the preferred two sets and there'd be a win set and he could put something in it and he would eventually be able to get to his ideal point, all right? That is the McKelvey Schofield Chaos Theorem. So in one dimension, we get the median voter theorem. In two or more dimensions, we get the chaos theorem, all right? So um, all that nice equilibrium uh, stuff and the, um, uh, results from the medium editor theorem do not hold. They are not applicable. If the um, 
the group decision making that you are looking at is multidimensional, and almost all of it is. This is why it frustrates me a little when I hear people casually use the median voter argument uh, for politics. Well, we all know the median voter. We don't know that, actually. You know, McKelvey Schofield chaos theorem has been out a while, since the 70s. Um, in fact, I, I thought that McKelvey and Schofield should have won the uh, Nobel Prize for it. Schofield passed away last year, the year before, and McKelvey's uh, been gone a while. Um, I actually got to meet uh, Schofield. I got invited to a, um, a conference in honor of his work, kind of. He was retiring, and they held a big conference, and I got to come and present some of my um, computer models um, of uh, some that were related to some of his work. Um, but in any event, um, the McKelvey Schofield Chaos Theorem tells us that there's no equilibrium in multidimensional spaces using pairwise majority rule. So there's not going to be this nice stable point where we get to it and stop. Now, we, we're not going to get to this in this class, but that doesn't mean there is literally chaos. It doesn't mean necessarily that the results of group decision making move all over the place. All right. Being able to do that requires a whole lot of freedom in terms of the political institutions that are being used. And in most cases, the political institutions constrain the ability of an agenda setter to just go anywhere through the space. But on your homework um, for the class I'm filming this for, uh, I may reuse these videos, so um, uh, I don't want to necessarily say for everyone, but for the homework for the class I'm filming this for anyways, um, there's it, there's a, a assignment where you have to try and move the um, status quo to a particular ideal point. So you have to propose something, vote on it, and then move it. Now I'm going to show you a, a little trick later on in the screencast where you don't have to go through this process every time something passes. There's a little bit faster way to do it using something called the cut point method. I'm going to do a whole separate screencast on that. But in any event, the point of this screencast is about the chaos theorem, all right? That there is no equilibrium here. Now, I've got an asterisk here. That means there are some really, really, really special cases where you do get an equilibrium, but they're exceedingly rare. But I want to show them to you because um, Shepsley brings them up in the chapter. Here's one example. For this configuration of voters, the ideal point of voter two has an empty win set, right? The, uh, if the status quo policy is at, at voter two's um, ideal point, there is no overlap between any two people's preferred two sets. Therefore, nothing can defeat the ideal point of X2. Now, he's not a median because a median is not a um, well mathematically defined thing in a two-dimensional space, all right? But his ideal point or her ideal point, X2, cannot be defeated in pairwise majority rules. So that's one example, but really that's kind of a trivial case because let me flip this thing on the side. That's really a single dimensional model, right? Here's our issue dimension and here are their ideal points and they would have utility functions, right? So this is just the ideal point of the median voter on that one dimension, all right? So that one, that's not all that interesting, but there is, there are more interesting cases, all right? So here's an example of five voters, all right? These voters are arrayed in such a way that the ideal point of X2 here, this voter, voter two, has an empty majority rule win set. There's nowhere where a minimum majority overlaps. So what do we need? What's the win set, right? Win set here for five people, divide by two, that's 2.5, round up to the integer, that's three. I need three voters preferred two sets to overlap. And there does not exist such a set of alternatives in this particular model, all right? So for this configuration of voters, the ideal point of voter two has an empty win set, all right? And this is not reducible to a single issue dimension. This isn't like that trivial case I showed you just a second ago, all right? This is a true multidimensional situation and yet, there is an equilibrium point in pairwise majority rule, all right? So this configuration of points that leads to a Condorcet winner in a two issue dimension model is known as radial symmetry, right? Or more commonly, they, this is called 
the plot conditions. Right? Both of these situations meet the plot conditions. So Plot was a um, social choice theorist. I don't know if he was an economist or a political science, but he proved that the McKinley Schofield chaos theorem had one exception. If people's ideal points are arrayed in such a perfect way that there is what is geometrically called radial symmetry, then there will be one point, the ideal point of the person who's sort of in the middle, that will have an empty majority rule win set. All right, so what is the definition of the plot conditions? Well, here's what Shepsley says. If voters possess distance-based spatial preferences, yes, they do, all of our spatial voting models, that's true, and their ideal points are distributed in a radial, radially symmetric fashion, with X star being the distinguished ideal point, and the number of voters is odd, then the win set of that distinguished point would be empty set. I should have empty set there, not zero. Yeah, that doesn't mean anything to me, you guys. Uh, I do this stuff for a living, and that's a hard one for me to understand. I can eventually get it if I read it three or four times. But let me give you my version of the plot conditions, because you're going to, at times, want to check for it. I'm going to ask you, does this situation have a Condorcet winner? You're going to say Condorcet winner, so that's pairwise majority rule. So I'm looking for where a simple majority's preferred two sets overlap. All right. First thing you want to check is do the plot conditions hold? If they do, then you already know that you have a Condorcet winner. If they don't, then you know you don't have a Condorcet winner. There's no need to go through drawing 100 preferred two sets and win sets. All, right? all you have to do is check the plot conditions. So here's my way of doing it. All right? It's storming here, so hopefully my power doesn't go out in the middle uh, and I lose everything I've been videoing. So first, is there one voter in the middle of the cloud of ideal points? So it's a two-dimensional space, so I'm just calling it kind of the cloud of ideal points. This one's not so much a cloud, but you get the idea. And in both these situations, there is a voter that is sort of in the middle. Then, for every other voter, does a ray passing through the middle voter, so for X3, a ray passing through the middle voter, hit another voter? Is that true for everybody? So, here's the, the voter in the middle of the cloud of dots. I go on a ray from this voter, and I do. I hit another voter. Now let me do it for this voter. I go on a ray through the middle voter, and I do hit another voter. This meets the plot conditions. All right, now let's do the complicated case. X2 here is sort of in the middle of the cloud of dots. For voter X4, let me go on a ray through X2, and I hit X5. So for X5, the same thing is true, of course, because it's a symmetric condition, all right? What about for X3? Do I go through the middle voter? Do I hit another voter? Yes. So in effect, what's going on here is X5 is canceling out X4. X3 is canceling out X1. So there's never going to be an overlap of three voters that we need. All right. So this is the way I check for the plot conditions. All right. If the plot conditions are met, the ideal point of that middle voter, do not call it the median voter. It is not a median. They are just the voter in the middle of the cloud of dots. They, their ideal point has an empty win set. All right? Every other distribution of voter ideal points has no equilibrium, chaos theorem. It is an exceedingly rare condition, but it is a condition you should know about um, uh, when using these models. All right? Last thing in this little screencast, then I'm going to do the cut point method, cut line method, I'm sorry, for helping you uh, uh, play around with the chaos theorem in another screencast. But what about the unanimity rule win set, right? We did the unanimity rule win set for single dimensional models, all right? Well, the unanimity rule win set is the set of all points where every voter's preferred two set overlaps, just like it was in the single dimensional model, all right? And in fact, we've already seen it here. Remember, when I gave you this alternative Y, the set, all the points in red are strictly preferred by all three of them, all right? And everything that's green, we don't know exactly what's going to happen in the green, but in the red, definitely. So the red, all the alternatives in red, not red or green, cross that out, because we, indifference points are weird. We don't necessarily know that 
people are going to vote for it. So we can't say it's in the win set. To be in the win set, it has to be inside of the preferred two sets of everyone. So I will fix that typo and uh, re-upload this, all right? So this is the unanimity rule win set of Y, because everybody's preferred two sets overlap in that red area. So it's a little bit easier to find usually than the majority rule win set, because the majority rule win set, you're checking for all these combinations, especially if you have more than three voters. But the unanimity rule, you're looking for where everybody, if you have 11 voters, all 11 need to overlap. If you have 15 voters, all 15 need to overlap. If you have 155 voters, all 155 preferred two sets need to overlap. All those alternatives are the unanimity rule win set. So here's how that relates to the Pareto set. All points outside of the Pareto set have a unanimity rule win set. So Y has a unanimity rule win set. If I drew another point over here, um, say K, and drew all the preferred two sets, it would have a unanimity rule win set. All points outside of the Pareto set have a unanimity rule win set, a non-empty unanimity rule win set. Here's Z. Remember Z, there was no place that all three of their preferred two sets overlapped, right? Z has an empty unanimity rule win set. Z is inside of the Pareto set. All points inside the Pareto set have an empty unanimity rule win set. There are no alternatives everyone prefer. All right. So that's a really quick way to be able to tell whether an alternative has a unanimity rule win set or not. You draw the Pareto set, which is always easy to do. You just go around the ed outside edge of all of the um, ideal points. Is the alternative inside that Pareto set? If it is, then it has an empty unanimity rule win set. If it's not, then it has a unanimity rule win set. Then you got to draw the indifference curves, find the win unanimity rule win set, and find a point that beats it if that's what's been asked. Okay, one more screencast after this, guys.